Hey everybody, welcome back. So the next standard that we're going to talk about is the so-called Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard or PCI DSS. And PCI DSS, just like the name implies, unlike ISO 27001, for example, is industry specific. It's specific to companies that either store, process, or transmit cardholder data. And these companies fall under two, one, one of the two big uh, categories. Uh, they're either merchants or service providers. So if you are one of the two, then you have to consider becoming compliant with PCI DSS. But first, let's talk a little bit about the history of the standard. The PCI DSS was created in 2004 by some of the biggest companies in the payment card industry, namely Visa, MasterCard, JCB, Amex, and Discover. And what happened back then was that these companies came together and they said, okay, so right now, each one of us has its own security standard that it's maintaining. But why don't we agree on a common standard that's going to become the standard of our industry? And instead of having other companies become compliant with five different security standards, why don't we ask them to become compliant with this common standard. And this is how the PCI DSS was created. And the organization that they formed is called the PCI SSC or the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council. And this organization maintains the PCI DSS to this day. Now, it's important to know that there are other standards that the PCI SSC maintains as well, apart from PCI DSS. Uh, these are standards like uh, PADSS and so on, and they address payment card security from different angles, like, for example, from the application side, from the PIN security side, and so on. But the PCI DSS is obviously the most famous one uh, from the list. Now, as we said, you need to be an organization that either stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data in order to um, become compliant with PCI DSS. So probably one of the easiest examples that we could give is a retail chain. So if you go to one of their stores and you have the ability to pay with your a credit card, then this company needs to consider compliance with PCI DSS. Now, the standard itself has 12 requirements, and these requirements are these 12 requirements are grouped into six categories. Now, we're not going to go into too much detail uh, regarding each and every one of the requirements, but we're just going to uh, read them right now so that you get an understanding of what they're about. But keep in mind that these requirements are just high level ones, right? So for example, if we take the first one that says install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data, it's not as easy as saying, okay, uh, yes, I have a firewall and uh, I am uh, maintaining its configuration. So yeah, I'm good to go. Below that, there are a number of, of lower level sub requirements that you need to address in order to become compliant with that high level one. And this is probably a good place to mention that there are um, two ways to become compliant with PCI DSS. Uh, one is uh, in the form of the so called SAC or, or SAQ, self assessment questionnaire. So you can think of that as a a big uh, or a long um, a checklist that you can fill in yourself and you can um, use that as, um, uh, as as proof of your um, compliance with PCI DSS. And the other form of compliance is the so-called ROC or the report on compliance. And the ROC is a very 
large document that you also cannot feel in yourself. You need to have a qualified assessor for that. And it, it, it could either be somebody who you have on staff who's qualified as an ISA or, or an internal security assessor, or it could be someone external, somebody from a third party company that you have contracted to perform your PCI DSS assessment but the rock needs to be filled in by a qualified person and the rock is again very detailed and the assessor who's filling who is filling in the rock needs to make sure that they have provided enough evidence um, that supports their um, judgment of your compliance if you want Okay, so uh, coming back to the list of requirements, the second one says do not use vendor supplied defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. Um, this one might sound like something that's uh, almost common sense, but again, remember that these are just the high level requirements. You have a lot going on uh, beneath the surface. Um, and, and something else that I think is important to mention, um, don't think of these security standards, uh, PCI DSS, ISO 27001, and so on, don't think of them as a form of, of panacea. Don't think of them as something that, uh, if you're compliant with, with them, then you are, you're good to go. You don't have to do anything else regarding your security posture. No, it's not like that at all. It's more like they're a bare minimum that you, for example, if you're compliant with PCI DSS, then you have covered the bare minimum that PCI DSS wants you to cover in order to become compliant with it. But it doesn't mean in any way that you should stop there, or it doesn't mean in any way that you should just um, get your uh, attestation of compliance that shows that you're compliant with, with the standard and then not do anything until it's time for, for your... Um, uh, for the revalidation of your compliance. Okay, so uh, going back to the list of requirements, requirement free says protect stored card holder data. As we've discussed earlier, when we're talking about protecting data, we're talking about protecting data at rest and data in transit and requirement free here talks about protecting, protecting data at rest. So we're talking about encryption, we're talking about using strong encryption to um, and then in requirement four, which says encrypt transmission of cardholder data across open public networks, here we're talking about um, protecting data in transit. And again, um, strong encryption, making sure that um, cardholder data cannot leak because you have implemented weak controls, but instead you have protected it uh, in every way possible. Then we have requirement five, which um, says protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software or programs. Something which, again, you might think is common sense and something that you should be doing no matter what, but um, you might be surprised how often things like that um, are underestimated and um, companies are underestimating the impact that not having something like that in place could have on their on their security posture. Then you have requirement six, which says develop and maintain secure systems and applications. And here we're talking about um, SDOC, we're talking about um, secure development and so on. Keep in mind that not everything that's in the standards is going to be applicable to you as a company. And for example, if we go back to this separation of, um, uh, of merchants versus service providers, for example, if you're a merchant, then obviously the service, require, the service provider requirements are not going to be applicable to you and vice versa. Um, so for example, this is something that your assessor is going to uh, make sure that they have um, assess properly which requirements are applicable to you and which are not. Then uh, going back to the list, uh, requirement seven says restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. Um, as we've talked about earlier in the course, the need to know principle, one of the key security principles 
uh, along with uh, separation of duties and so on. Um, requirement eight says identify and authenticate access to system components. Uh, again, something that's very important. Requirement nine talks about uh, the physical access to your CHD and how you're restricting that. So um, you might be a company that doesn't have a lot of uh, infrastructure on-prem, then uh, in this case, a lot of that is not going to be applicable to you, but everything that is applicable to you, you, you would want to make sure that you are um, compliant with the standard regarding it. Then requirement 10 says track and monitor all access to network resources and cloud holder data. Here you will have to um, probably show your uh, SIM tool that you're using and how you're using it and so on. Requirement 11 says regularly test security systems and processes. Also something very important that your auditor will assess in your company. And requirement 12, the last requirement says maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. Um, just to note here that when you become PCI DSS compliant, um, there's this misunderstanding sometimes that there is a certificate that you obtain when you become compliant. There's actually no such thing. There's the, the, the closest thing to a certificate that you're going to get is the so-called AOC or the attestation of compliance. And this is actually the document that you can share with the world. This is like an executive summary that says, yes, this company is compliant with all of these requirements. And for example, um, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, all of these companies that provide public cloud services, they have these dedicated portals on which they are uploading documentation regarding their compliance status. And um, on these portals, you will find, for example, their AOC uh, documents regarding PCI DSS, and you can download them and, and you can um, indeed see for yourself that these companies are um, compliant with PCI DSS. Okay, um, thank you very much, and I will see you in the next lecture.